Welcome back, party people. Mike here with The Social Life of Language, and today we are looking at an article written by Richard Ruiz entitled Orientations in Language Planning, first published in 1984. Okay, so we're dealing with language planning, which is tricky business, dangerous business. Because when we talk about languages, we are talking about people. That's why Ruiz himself said that language planning is social planning. For example, when we try to protect languages, we're also trying to protect the people who use those languages. So the way we imagine how language works in society can have some very serious consequences. But thinking about the way we think about language is kind of hard to do because you kind of have to take a lot of steps back to see how you orient yourself to something like language. In this article, Ruiz breaks down three major orientations that we can see in American society. So what are they? Let's find out. So first, in the title, what does Ruiz mean by orientation? Because we kind of got to be careful with terms that seem really common and that we don't really think about very much. In the article, he says, Orientation, as it is used here, refers to a complex of dispositions toward language and its role, and toward languages and their role in society. So in this article, he's making these orientations very obvious, specifically by uncovering them in some language policies from that time. So when you orient yourself to something, you are approaching an issue with a certain attitude, which is guided by a set of beliefs, and they could be conscious or unconscious. For example, let's say you're teaching a class. You'll very likely approach the situation in a certain way. Maybe you believe you shouldn't say the word f Huh? Don't say that? Not, per not professional. Well, so your approach to the situation kind of guides your behavior and kind of sets up certain things to happen. Maybe certain goals will emerge or maybe your approach carries with it certain expectations of what you think might happen or what you think should happen. So in this sense, when we think of the idea of orientation, in the back of our minds, we can partly be thinking of how we approach something, which is connected to all these societal beliefs, all of this social baggage that we bring with with us, or what Ruiz calls dispositions. Here we can move into the first major approach to language planning that Ruiz calls the language as problem orientation. Okay, so let's think about what happens when we approach something as a problem. We might automatically start thinking of a solution, or we might assume that something is broken and we need to fix it. On the other hand, if we approach language as, for example, a human rights issue, then we might start thinking of ways that we can protect protect languages through judicial means. Because we start thinking of language in this legal way. So you see, depending on the way you approach what language is and its role in society, the outcomes of that approach will look really different. Because how we orient ourselves to an issue, whether it's in our heads, in public conversations, or in the way institutions write policies, our orientation makes certain things more likely to happen. So we need to consider how our approach to social issues bring with it the social baggage of the era. Now this was published in 1984 and Ruiz identified how the perception of non-English speakers at the time was kind of f***ed up. Oh, that's not professional. Okay, I see it. I see it. Specifically the way groups and their language problems became linked to poverty, handicap, low educational achievement, and little or no social mobility. In other words, language was a problem to be overcome. And during this era, we had the Bilingual Education Act of 1968, which basically treated non-English language groups as having some sort of handicap. And there was this underlying belief that if non-English speakers were to just transition to English, all the problems in American society would suddenly disappear. That's part of the ideological baggage of the time. So it's no coincidence that the Bilingual Education Act emerged during the times of this so-called war on poverty. As Ruiz said, perhaps the perception most compelling the connection of language and language diversity with social problems is that multilingualism leads ultimately to a lack of social cohesiveness. With everyone speaking their own language, political and social consensus is impossible. Ruiz is not messing around here. When it comes to the language as problem orientation, 
He bluntly said that language as problem orientation offers no hope. Okay, let's move on to the second orientation Ruiz identifies, what he calls the language as right orientation. So at this time, there was a strong international movement to include people's languages as part of basic human rights. Which remember, when you approach a language situation in a certain way, we start thinking of certain kinds of remedies. And also during this time, we had the 1975 amendment to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which mandated that in some cases, the state needed to provide multilingual voting ballots to certain language groups. Not all of them, but some of them. So again, if our approach is language as right, we might start thinking how we can fit the idea of language into the idea of a right. Now this orientation had some really interesting effects because we started taking linguistic discrimination seriously. Or we started thinking that maybe people had the right not to be discriminated against just because of what language they use. Or that maybe people's voting ballots should be translated so that they can vote. However, as Ruiz pointed out, when we codify a law that's about linguistic practice, confrontations will emerge. Terms like compliance, enforcement, entitlement, requirements, and protection create an automatic resistance to whatever one is talking about. Their use creates confrontation. Different groups and authorities invoke their rights against each other. Children versus schools, parents versus school boards, majority versus minority groups, some minority groups versus others, states' rights versus federal authority, and so on. So notice when we orient ourselves to language in this way, different questions and different complications emerge that look totally different from the language as problem orientation. But just because the language as right orientation is messy doesn't mean that we should ignore the option, especially because it could establish some very basic rights even if they're just temporary. So Ruiz questioned if the language as right orientation would be enough by itself, which is why he proposed that maybe we should look at language as a resource, or the approach he called the language as resource orientation. He proposes as a response to the absolute cluster he proposed this as a response to the mess that the other two orientations had created. And he hoped that the language as resource orientation could potentially enhance the status of language minority groups, and maybe even ease the tension between language groups. So here we should kind of clarify what he means by the word resource. Because spoiler, the language as resource orientation has pretty much taken over the conversation. Especially when we think about treating language as an economic resource. But I think it's important to highlight that he wasn't just thinking solely in economic terms. In a different article, he defined language resources as consisting of internal structures, which includes codes, discursive practices, conventions, etc., and external structures, which includes language maintenance institutions like churches, media, school, family practices. So he was predicting that the conversation would go a different way if we approach the language as a resource. For example, it might emphasize multilingualism as important to diplomatic relations or national security, or maybe that multilingualism could become an American interest that would bring prosperity to everybody. But it seems like he was really hoping that it would directly benefit language minority groups. Now, the question is, decades later, did it work? Did the language as resource orientation work? Well, yes and no. But that, my friends, is a very complex story for another day. Okay, so let's close out with a couple more quotes. Ruiz clearly says, the language as problem orientation offers no hope. The rights orientation has had mixed results. Importantly, I don't think that Ruiz was saying, let's just drop everything and only talk about language as a resource. Because in the article, he also says, language planning can benefit from a variety of approaches. And that in some circumstances, some approaches are better than others. What we can be sure of is that Ruiz was committed to making making the best out of a really bad situation. We should devise strategies by which we can take advantage of transformative possibilities that exist even in the worst cases. Well, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to stop by maestromikemena.com to say hi. And I also want to send a big shout out to the more than 
40 supporters that donate to the Social Life of Language Patreon account. I think it's important to recognize that most of y'all are college students, so I just wanna say that I see you. And I know damn well how much a couple bucks is worth when you also got books to buy and you got bills to pay and tuition and all that. So I just wanna say thank you very much. Once again, this is Mike with the Social Life of Language. And we're done.